Hello and welcome uh, to the Island Ponds Community Workshop. I want to welcome you on behalf of Great Pond Foundation's board and staff, and I want to say thank you for joining us today at this workshop. Um, last week we had over 70 um, different members of the community coming here to learn about different aspects of pond health. So we want to thank you for coming together and focusing on protecting the waters, which help sustain the island. Um, I wanted to recognize um, the work of our team. Um, behind the scenes, Julie Pringle and Aaron Hefner have done a lot of work, and David Bauk has really been the one who's brought us all together today. So uh, David, take it away. Thanks, Emily. Um, <clears throat> just a brief intro. Uh, this entire series of events was made possible through the generous support of the ED Foundation that has our collective and heartfelt gratitude for their dedication to our island community. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to take this opportunity to again thank the members of our steering committee, Amy Salzman and Greg Palermo, uh, for their tireless efforts in making these events a success. I'd like to thank our keynote speaker, Dr. Christopher Gobler, for lending his time to join us today. I'd also like to give a special thank you to our moderator, Julie Pringle of our own Great Pond Foundation, as well as to all of our wonderful panelists for granting us their time, wisdom, and expertise for today's panel discussions. Lastly, I'd like to thank our island community as a whole for all the wonderful feedback we received while creating these events and for their collective dedication and care in managing our shared island pond resources. Uh, the Island Ponds Community Workshop was created from a recognized desire for increased communication and collaboration between the many public entities, nonprofit organizations, riparian owners associations, and individuals who manage and care for our island ponds. The primary goal of this series is to help build and reinforce a community among pond managers. It's our hope that the topics discussed herein will help to foster a greater understanding of the collective issues we face in all the ponds and watersheds across Martha's Vineyard, as well as provide inspiration for more action-oriented conversations and initiatives in the future. For the curious members of the public who are joining us today, we hope that these workshops will provide you with a glimpse of some of the major issues that we as a community are facing. So this series is comprised of three separate events throughout this December and January. The primary subject of each workshop was determined through an outreach survey that we conducted to gauge the overall interest in a variety of important issues facing our island ponds. We received an outstanding response to that survey, the results of which determine the content of these events. Last week, we focused on excess nitrogen and land use. Today, we'll shift our focus to harmful algal blooms, followed by a supplementary information session on some invasive species. Our last workshop on January 13th will focus on data and pond management in the era of climate change. Now, before we get started, I'll quickly explain the structure of this workshop. Uh, this entire event is being recorded and will afterwards be accessible to the public through the Great Pond Foundation's website at a later date. Uh, we're using a webinar format, so all attendees are automatically muted with video turned off so that we can focus on our speakers. In a few moments, I'll hand over the microphone to Dr. Gobler for his keynote presentation, for which there'll be a short question and answer session at the end. If you have questions, please type them in your chat window, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. We will take questions on a first come, first serve basis, and we'll do our best to field as many as possible in the time provided. After our keynote segment, we'll begin our panel discussion and we'll continue taking questions from the audience. Again, please just utilize your chat function, type your questions, and we'll do our best to get as, to as many of them as we can. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Christopher Gobler. Dr. Gobler received both his master's and PhD from Stony Brook University, where he is now a professor within the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. In 2014, he was appointed as the Associate Dean of Research for the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. And in 2015, he was named co-director for the Center for Clean Water Technology. His group investigates how anthropogenic activities such as climate change, eutrophication, and the overharvesting of fisheries alters the natural biogeochemical and or ecological functioning of coastal ecosystems. And in just a few moments, he will speak to us regarding his research, uh, research efforts in the study of harmful algal blooms caused by multiple classes of phytoplankton in diverse ecosystems. And we are particularly excited to hear from him today as his work studying harmful algal blooms throughout Long Island offers us a glimpse of systems similar to those found here in Martha's Vineyard but with greater and continued developmental pressure. And in a sense, he has seen that which may be just on our horizon. And so with that, thank you, Dr. Gobler, for being with us today. We're very excited and uh, you have the floor. Okay, well, thank you, 
David, and thank you for uh, all for the uh, invitation here to speak to you all about harmful algal blooms, something I've been studying for quite some time. And uh, this is really a general overview, so I'll try to get through that and then happy to talk about details anybody's more specifically interested in um, by the end. And so when we talk about harmful algal blooms, it's important to recognize that these harmful algal blooms are comprised of phytoplankton. Um, and in many ways, uh, we need phytoplankton. They serve as the base of marine food webs, as, as is shown here. So in, uh, in many ecosystems, the productivity of phytoplankton is linked to the productivity of fisheries. Um, phytoplankton also create half of the oxygen on the planet. So they're very, very important. And however, uh, and there are thousands of these species, but we do know that there are several hundred of them that can be harmful to marine ecosystems. And when we use that word ecosystem, I mean the inhabitants of the ecosystem, including humans. And so that's where we came up with the term harmful algal bloom, specifically being defined as the growth of a harmful algal species one, reaching a density that has a negative impact uh, on a given ecosystem. And if you've sort of been around for quite some time and following these sorts of things, uh, there was a point in time in the 20th century, actually almost at the end of the 20th century, when harmful algal blooms were just called red tide uh, as a blanket. And that's because most of them in marine ecosystems are caused by something known as dinoflagellates that have a red pigment. Um, you're looking at one of those events right here. Um, but you know the, the, the term became a little um, uh, inappropriate at times. So for example, in this particular case, this red tide uh, had no measurable impacts despite the uh, uh, strong discoloration of the water. Uh, and in addition, we've come to recognize that uh, these events, uh, that is a specific species of, of uh, phytoplankton growing to a density that's harmful to an ecosystem, can be many different colors uh, and can occur in many different types of ecosystems, both marine, freshwater, and brackish. And that's why in, in the late 90s, the, uh, there was a scientific consensus to try to use the term harmful algal blooms so that we we're all talking about the same thing. Now in marine ecosystems, uh, most harmful algal blooms uh, are harmful and people worry about them because uh, they can make a toxin that circulates through uh, the food web. And in marine ecosystems in particular, the most common root, root of those toxins to humans um, is through shellfish and shellfish consumption. And that's why with many of the harmful algal blooms, they're associated with different, uh, what are known as shellfish poisoning events. Um, you know, uh, filter feeding bivalves like clams, mussels, uh, oysters, as well as uh, scallops, quahogs, whatever you want to call them, can filter many, many liters of water in a day and concentrate uh, these algae and their toxins in their tissues. And so that's why we have across the US these different what we call shellfish poisoning syndromes uh, that are found in different parts of the country, um, each caused by a specific species of phytoplankton uh, and related to a specific toxin and each having a different human health outcome. Now, in many cases, these harmful algal bloom toxins can be quite uh, serious and potent. So for example, um, this is, uh, to read this table, when it says minimum lethal dose, you have to read it in reverse. So the lower the number, the more potent the toxin. And so I just point this out that, for example, saxitoxin, um, which is actually found in the Northeast U.S. and marine waters, is about uh, a thousand times more potent than sodium cyanide, that compound that you find used in many mystery novels back in the 20th century uh, for poisoning people in their coffee or tea, for example. Um, so these are serious toxins, and these harmful algal blooms are found throughout the U.S. You know, there's not a coastal state in the Union uh, that's not experiencing a different, uh, at least one harmful algal bloom. And in many water bodies, uh, there are multiple harmful algal blooms happening in a given year. In fact, where, where I am in eastern Long Island, um, we easily document um, at least five or more harmful algal blooms every single year uh, in marine and freshwater bodies. And, um, and again, this one, this map is particularly focused on uh, marine water bodies, but you go into the inland waters and think about lakes and ponds, and you can see the situation is even more widespread. Um, beyond harmful algal blooms having an impact on um, 
with regards to toxins and toxins cycling through the marine food web, uh, there's a whole other class of harmful algal blooms that we call ecosystem disruptive. And so that, that is, there's certain harmful algal blooms that are perfectly harmless to humans, but lethal uh, to marine uh, and in some cases, freshwater organisms. And those top two figures, uh, images were taken actually in the same water body um, on uh, one month apart due to uh, the, the mortalities of the turtles and the fish associated with harmful algal blooms caused by two different uh, species. And um, as an example of these ecosystem disruptive harmful algal blooms, NOAA, the National Oceanic and uh, Atmospheric Association, attributes about half of marine mammal mortalities in the U.S. to harmful algal blooms. And so, for example, the state with the biggest coastline, uh, Alaska, in the United States, um, has every year has all sorts of marine mammal strandings and, and deaths, and they often and typically are finding uh, toxins from harmful algal blooms in these organisms. And there's a scientific consensus right now that the impacts of these harmful algal blooms is increasing with time. And so what you're looking at here is a map of uh, the event, the occurrence of paralytic shellfish poisoning in 1970 on the top map, uh, 2009 in the bottom map. Um, and we could update this with even more if we had it for uh, 2020, but you can see um, there's been just a great expansion um, and I was fortunate to collaborate with um, uh, harmful algal bloom scientists from across the United States to publish this paper earlier this year, taking a comprehensive assessment of all harmful algal blooms on every single coastline from Alaska all the way through the West Coast, Gulf Coast, and East Coast to demonstrate that there's been a statistically significant increase in the portion of U.S. coastlines that's been experiencing harmful algal blooms since 1990. So what's driving these trends? Well, there's a few things to think about. Uh, I probably should have put these up one at a time, but I'll go through them one at a time. Um, the first is we're obviously in a different scientific era than we were back in, say, 1970 or 1972. Um, we have much better technology now, both we're in the genomics era. We can detect things based on DNA. Uh, we know the toxins we're looking for. And so some of the trends are simply because we know about these harmful algal blooms in a uh, clearer sense, uh, we know what the toxins are, we have better technology for looking uh, at these. And thank goodness, every state that's experiencing these toxic algal blooms has monitoring programs to protect public health. Uh, and so when you're out there looking, you're more likely to find these things. Um, another thing is, as I already mentioned, you know, back in the day, we used the term red tides, and that was really just to ascribe harmful algal blooms to dinoflagellates and marine ecosystems. We've since sort of expanded the net and we know that there are other things that are also considered harmful algal blooms. So that's part of the trend as well. Although I would say that neither of these probably, neither of these, not even probably, neither of these would account for the expansion since 1990 when we've been counting in the same way and had just about the same technologies. In some limited cases, there's a case for what is known as anthropogenic transport. And so that is large shipping containers moving from one continent to another. Uh, and unloading water in a given harbor, and in that case, potentially discharging a harmful algal bloom. And um, you know, this is not a widespread occurrence, and it's difficult to, to um, conclusively document, but there have been some cases. Um, and then that gets us to the final three, which are really more the very serious anthropogenic impacts. I note that your last uh, seminar was focused on nutrient loading, and that's something I spend a lot of time doing as the director for the New York State Center for Clean Water Technology. And there is a scientific consensus that excessive anthropogenic nutrient loading from either fertilizer or wastewater uh, is promoting some of these harmful algal blooms that we see occurring both in marine and freshwater ecosystems. In some other cases, we know that overfishing can change food webs in strange ways or in sometimes very clear ways. And that can somehow favor, in some cases, favor the occurrence of harmful algal blooms. The easiest example of this is actually comes from Long Island, where we used to have the largest hard clam fishery on the east coast of the United States. Two thirds of the hard clams that were eaten in the United States came from the south shore of Long Island, specifically Great South Bay. There's been a more than 99% decline in those clams, and I told you how much they can filter. So we went from a situation where the water body was being filtered every three days to now it's not really being filtered at all, or maybe three months which is ecologically insignificant. 
Uh, and that's allowed, for example, in that particular case, a harmful algal bloom known as brown ties to occur. And then finally, there's no doubt that there's a role for climate change. And I'm going to highlight that in some of my future slides. Uh, and the obvious one is changing temperatures, but we can't forget, of course, that the levels of CO2 in our atmosphere have increased by uh, almost 50% um, during the last um, century alone. And you know, these are photosynthetic organisms, more CO2 in some cases may be beneficial. So from here, I'm just gonna give three examples of classes of harmful algal blooms uh, that occur in the waters around Martha's Vineyard. They also have occur in New York uh, and throughout the Northeast. And so just to uh, shine a light on some of the potential issues, and I'll start with uh, probably the most serious of the marine harmful algal blooms. Uh, those are caused by a genus known as Alexandrium, and we worry about these things because they make saxitoxin. Now, saxitoxin is that compound that's a thousand times more potent than cyanide, I pointed out before. And unfortunately, even now, people die from saxitoxin poisoning in the United States. Unfortunately, it's usually in Alaska, where the coastline is so large that their monitoring is uh, often not adequate to protect um, every single community in every single case. And again, this is a global issue. You can see all over um, the world from uh, almost every continent. Um, in that review that I pub we published earlier this year, this is the distribution of paralytic shellfish poisoning from since 1990. Uh, and so you can see here in the Northeast US, we're definitely in a hot spot for uh, Alexandrian blooms. And there's definitely a climate change link. Um, this is a paper that I published, um, this is four years ago now, in the Proceedings in the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, and what we did is we looked at how Alexandria would respond to temperature, and we looked at global patterns of temperature change since 1982 using some satellite data. And so what you can see is that, uh, actually what you see is one of the central tenets of climate change biology on planet Earth. And that is, as our planet warms, organisms start moving towards the poles to stay in their thermal optimum. Um, and more importantly, what you see in our neck of the woods is that the Northeast US, specifically the Gulf of Maine and on South, has been some of the most rapid warming waters in coastal zones of almost anywhere. Um, and so the warmer colors are areas where the duration of the bloom season has increased since 1982, and the blue where it's um, decreased. And again, that's the idea of the blooms moving north with time. Uh, and these numbers are in days. And so if this is a days of increased season per year, so if you look at this time frame, what we're looking at is an additional month or two uh, of a bloom season for this organism. Um, these events have been widespread on Long Island. Um, and so what I'm depicting here is both the relative cell densities uh, and also events where shellfish have gotten so toxic that the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation has needed to close those shellfish beds uh, to protect human health because the levels exceeded the FDA um, allowable level, which I believe is, uh, I'll maybe get it wrong, but I think it's 80 micrograms per 100 grams of shellfish tissue. Um, and in many cases, like in Northport and Shinnecock Bay and the Riverhead region, these have occurred many, many times over the years. And one thing we've been able to very clearly conclude is that these events are promoted by wastewater-derived nitrogen. Um, and I'm not sure of the situation throughout Martha's Vineyard, but uh, through most of Suffolk County, homes are not connected to sewage treatment plants. And so they're discharging directly to ground, which then makes its way right into coastal waters. Um, and the effects of excessive nitrogen is both promoting the blooms, but also making them more toxic. Saxitoxin is a nitrogen-rich compound. If you give this cell more nitrogen, it makes more toxin. And we've seen that on Long Island, but that's been established really globally. Um, I'm next going to pivot inland to some talk about freshwater uh, harmful algal blooms, known as cyanobacteria, um, and sometimes called blue-green algae. And I'm showing you two of the types of uh, freshwater cyanobacteria that are quite common in the left, microcystis, that forms these sort of colonies, and on the right, uh, anabena, which is sometimes known as, now known as delicospermum. 
And we worry about these because they make the toxins microcystin, uh, and in some cases, even anatoxin A. Microcystin is a gastrointestinal toxin, anatoxin A is a neurotoxin. Um, when these toxins were first discovered in the second half of the 20th century, scientists first named them fast death factor and very fast death factor because of the effect that they can have on mammals. And you can see these are widespread events all throughout the United States. And you can also see, particularly again here in the Northeast US, uh, there is on the one hand good monitoring. And when you have good monitoring, um, you have, uh, and, and probably also excessive, <laughs> in some cases, excessive nutrient loading, you have more of these events. And again, these are serious events. In some cases, the toxins, microcystin, has been associated with the occurrence of cancers, gastrointestinal cancers. When people are consuming water, they may be uh, uh, contaminated with these toxins. Um, in most cases, we're not consuming surface waters with these blooms uh, in the Northeast US. Um, but this is a threat to our pets. And so the CDC published this paper um, in the last decade, essentially showing there's been hundreds of cases of dog poisonings from cyanotoxins. We've almost every year here in Long Island, there's at least one event where a dog gets ill from uh, uh, cyanotoxins. And we've even had a dog, uh, a confirmed dog death, confirmed by the New York State Department of Health, of the cause of death being uh, that they had just in consumed uh, microcystis with microcystin. And if you look at the news, this is just an example uh, from a couple of summers ago, but this is in one week, the headlines across the US, you know, a dozen dogs dying in multiple states um, because of these events. And, um, and just last year, there was the uh, and, uh, uh, discovery that the mass die off of elephants that had been a mystery across the plains of Botswana and Africa uh, was associated with the onset um, of uh, toxic cyanobacterial blooms. Uh, and there's a forthcoming paper coming out of this momentarily. And without going through too much data, uh, as was the case with Alexandrium, you can see the headlines here in two very important papers. The top headline, just to read it out loud, controlling eutrophication by reducing both nitrogen and phosphorus. And so, you know, historically, people have always thought, oh, in fresh water, we just need to control phosphorus, and that should take care of the cyanobacterial blooms. Uh, but in the Northeast, in New York, and other places, uh, we're seeing that nitrogen is critically important for, again, not just promoting these blooms, but also affecting their toxicity. As I mentioned from uh, saxitoxin for the last harmful algal bloom, microcystin made by microcystis has 10 nitrogen atoms per molecule. And so again, if you give the cells more nitrogen, they'll make more of the toxin. Uh, and then the second paper there really speaks for itself. Uh, cyanobacteria have a higher temperature optimum than almost all freshwater, all types of freshwater uh, phytoplankton. And therefore, the warmer it gets, the more intense many of these blooms get. Uh, for a final bloom that I'm going to pivot back to now, uh, I'm going to just mention a final one here. Uh, the scientific name is Cochlodinium polycricoides, although they changed it to Margolifidinium polycricoides. So just when you, you know, <laughs> just when you thought you could pronounce one, then they go and change the name. You have to learn a new one. Uh, although these are more commonly called rust tides, and you can see from this image how they can discolor the water and how widespread they can be. Also, can be patchy. Um, this is one of these harmful algal blooms that has expanded uh, globally during the last. Uh, several decades. Again, this is since 1990, and you can see this organism is fairly common across uh, the U.S. eastern seaboard uh, and certainly across the northeast U.S. Uh, we've been seeing these events in New York since 2004. Uh, the one interesting thing, however, is that we had never seen this organism before 2004, and when I just go back here, I will just emphasize you really can't miss this event when it's happening. Whether you're looking at the macroscopic view, this is an aerial picture, or under a microscope, these are enormous cells. Um, you know, there's been active monitoring for HABs in Long Island since 1985. This organism was never seen until 2004, and now it's been a recurrent event. Um, and again, uh, this particular harmful algal bloom, in good news, does not make a human toxicant. Uh, and bad news, it's known as an ichthyotoxic harmful algal bloom. It can kill fish. 
And so we learned that the hard way at our marine lab in Southampton. Uh, that's where the images from below came, where we had fish uh, in flowing seawater. And uh, one of these blooms moved in overnight and killed off all those fish. We've had similar events with shellfish uh, because uh, both, let's see, scallops, oysters, um, for sure, being vulnerable to these harmful algal blooms. And in New York, particularly Eastern Long Island, some fishermen use what are known as pound nets, which collect fish uh, in pens, and, uh, and there's been mortality events in those situations as well. And again, um, there's a role for excessive nitrogen here. These are experiments that we published uh, in the journal Harmful Algae, essentially comparing the rust tide algae, coccodinium, to other types of phytoplankton, essentially just showing that the rust tide organism is more likely to benefit from excessive nitrogen than the organisms competing against it. And there's also a room uh, and a role for climate change. It's a paper we published just a couple of years ago now, um, looking again at the bloom season of coccodinium uh, across the U.S. East Coast. And what you see is that we are collectively, when well, it's Martha's Vineyard or Long Island, in the bullseye for this organism because of the time of year we're experiencing warming. And because of the time of year we're experiencing warming and the amount of warming we've been having since 1982, you can see the bloom season now increasing more, just like with Alexander, more than two days um, in some cases uh, per year. And again, you add that up over a long time season, you go to a situation where uh, and uh, just speaking to Long Island, there was never a window for this organism. It never got warm enough in the beginning, uh, in the, uh, back in the 20th century. But now we've exceeded its temperature. We exceed its temperature optimum every single year, or I should say we reach its temperature optimum every single year. So we went from a situation in the 20th century where we never got into the right temperature range. We never saw this organism. Now we're always in a temperature range in summer, and these blooms can go on, in some cases, for months. So wrapping up, um, I've shown you that harmful algal blooms are an expanding threat in both marine and freshwater bodies, and uh, that excessive nitrogen loading can promote these HABs and therefore be a threat to ecosystems, economies, pets, human health. Um, and climate change is expanding the window of opportunity for these harmful algal blooms event, harmful algal bloom events, and in some cases, promoting their expansion. So with that, I will thank everyone for their attention. And if there are any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. All right. Thank you, Dr. Gobo. That was fantastic. Let me uh, switch my view here for a second. Um, so. I have a question for you, and I'm a I'm I'm a complete layman, or I consider myself a layman. So you you know be be uh, be gentle, but uh, in your in your research, looking across the country and uh, looking at all the different, you, you mentioned that every single state has a monitoring program now in place of, of some sort. Um, do you notice in the throughout the different states, have you noticed a a, a, a lot of differences in say the standards? of what that trigger public policy response? Um, or is there is it kind of uniform? Well, in, in good news, uh, for the HABs that make toxins that are regulated by the FDA, it's uniform, right? Mm -hmm. And so that is, for example, like I said, shellfish can't have more than 80 micrograms per 100 grams of uh, tissue. And so the state of Massachusetts has a testing program, Rhode Island has a testing program, New York has a testing program, Connecticut does. And, uh, and if they see something above that, by federal law, they have to make sure that product does not go to market. Um, and, and to do that, they, they will shut down the shellfish beds. Now, I, I will say a caveat to that. So that's the federal standard that's promulgated through the states. Um, but I will say that um, some states can take a more conservative uh, approach to these things. And the, for example, they may decide that, well, if we get to half of that, we're gonna shut things down. Or if we, you know, there's other sorts of tests that can be done. Um, so in, in New York for a while, they were using these dipstick tests and if they saw any level, they would shut things down. 
and then get further information. So there is a federal standard, but you know the states can be more uh, conservative um, if they choose to do so. And Julie, I think uh, you have a, a question you, you uh, typed into my chat over here. Do you want to just ask away? You have to turn your mute off, yeah. Sure. Um, great talk, Dr. Gobler. Um, so you were mentioning and talking about the monitoring efforts that the state of New York, sorry, somebody just fell down, um, the monitoring efforts for these tabs on Long Island. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate on um, kind of the program, the monitoring programs that are in place. Sure. You know, I will say it's there. there is a lot of monitoring um, and it is a little spread out uh, with regards to who's doing what. Um, so for example, I mentioned Alexandrium is the biggest concern when it comes to human health. Uh, you know, people eat contaminated shellfish, they can get quite sick. And so, um, so the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation uh, puts out mussels in the spring at distinct locations that they feel are sentinel sites or sites that are likely to experience a bloom. Um, and then once a week, we'll retrieve a, a sub batch of those mussels to test them for levels of saxitoxin. Um, when it comes to freshwater bodies, it's a little bit more piecemeal. Um, my lab has been designated by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation to be the lab that tests freshwater bodies from um, essentially through downstate New York through Long Island. So we'll get samples from New York City um, all the way out to Montauk in New York. And, um, and so in that case, any sample that comes in, we test and we report out to the DEC by the end of the day. Um, and in addition, we know areas that are uh, potentially um, are, are more likely to see a bloom. And so some of those areas we on our own uh, will monitor on a weekly basis. And, uh, and we coordinate with different agencies. So for example, Suffolk County, which is the county where we are in Eastern Long Island, um, you know, we're in touch with them, I would say, in season almost every day, in which case they may be delivering a water sample for us to analyze both freshwater and marine. Um, so that uh, gives you a little bit of a sense of how things uh, are going here. Great. Um, I got a question here from Mark, and he's wondering, is anyone looking at paraphytic algae on seagrass? So, you know, there's, there's not a lot of looking at that, although I do think in some, they're, they're, uh, it's an interesting topic, particularly in freshwater bodies. Um, you know, there's some evidence to suggest that in some freshwater bodies, some of these harmful cyanobacteria grow epiphytically, not necessarily on seagrass because it's freshwater, so I would just call it sort of, you know, pond weed or some other kind of macrophyte, um, and then maybe become pelagic and become a threat uh, to the greater uh, ecosystem. But not a lot known on that and not a lot of monitoring on that. Uh, to my knowledge, on the East Coast of the US. Um, and then I have another question from the audience, uh, Gerald Jones. What can homeowners or riparian owners do to help out with these issues, um, both the prevention and fixing the problem? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess there's, you know, I, I, I'm not aware of the, uh, the wastewater situation, so maybe I can be educated now. On Martha's Vineyard, are all homes hooked up to sewage treatment plants or do homes have on-site wastewater systems? It kind of depends on where you are, but I, I, there is wastewater treatment in some of the major towns, the larger towns, Vineyard Haven, Edgartown, um, or plus, but uh, you know, up island, you see a lot of uh, septic systems. And the vast majority of the ponds are surrounded by tidal fives or cesspools, and occasionally we're a, a wastewater treatment plant um, actually on a pond. Yeah. And so, you know, and eat, so the part of the answer to the question there is knowing the answer to the question I pose, right? You, if you want to, every, every home has a nitrogen footprint, and that nitrogen footprint will be affecting both drinking water quality and surface water quality. And, you know, it's going to be drinking water first. And uh, I won't touch much on drinking water, but I'll just say that, um, you know, there, there, 
there's effects there for sure as well. And, um, you know, for, for optimal outcomes, uh, I think having nitrogen as low as possible in groundwater is a, uh, is a good thing for human health and for ecosystem health. And so, but in Eastern Long Island, um, you know, we're mainly unsewered. And so what we find is the biggest source of nitrogen is on-site wastewater. You know, even when you have, you know, big lawns with fertilizer, um, you know, that is always secondary almost. Uh, and I would guess would be the same case uh, compare, uh, on a per home basis compared to the septic system. So there's been an, an enormous initiative on Eastern Long Island during the past five years to implement a program to encourage homeowners to upgrade their septic systems to the point where you can actually, in many or most parts of Long Island, upgrade your septic system from a standard concrete kind of hole in the ground to a nitrogen removing system almost for free um, because there's been established grant and loan programs. And so, um, you know, that's, that I'm going to guess that that's probably, that's something that, that people could do. And, and again, it, there's the what you can do for your own home. And then there's also what you can do by speaking with, um, you know, regulatory agencies, people in government about changing policies. And then uh, I got one more question for you, and then we'll we'll uh, transition to the panel. And this one's actually from one of our panelists, Marina, um, and she's asking: Am I correct in thinking that the FDA does not regulate recreational use of waters that experience a bloom? And do you have some examples? Yeah, no, that's a hundred percent correct. FDA is only worried about the the, uh, the food in FDA for you know F for food, and um, yeah, so they're all their regulations are for the levels of toxin in food and typically they're just focused on shellfish uh, in some case uh, cases gastropods but um yeah so as far as recreation that's not on their their radar of the three halves that i called out uh the two marine ones to to everyone's knowledge are not really a recreational threat unlike the for example the harmful algal bloom in florida the red tide in florida that can be a recreational threat that doesn't seem to be the case for the ones the other marine blooms I described, but as I'm hopefully everybody's aware, these freshwater cyanobacteria bacteria can be a recreational threat uh, and are more likely to cause problems, as I mentioned, for dogs, uh, but even for humans, incidental contact can lead to skin irritation, can lead to uh, incidental consumption of water, um, all of which could have uh, negative um, human health outcomes. Got it, great. Well, thank you very much. That was fantastic, um, a wonderful presentation. And thank you. Uh, now, let's see here. We're going to transition into our panel discussion. Um, and let me just make sure my screen is doing the right thing. Okay, wonderful. Um, so let's start our panel. Um, our moderator today is none other than uh, Great Pond Foundation Scientific Program Manager, Julie Pringle. Um, Julie's gonna begin our panel discussion with introductions from our panelists, after which um, we'll be taking questions from the audience and posing a few prepared questions um, of our own. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Gobler, for that presentation. And thank you, Julie, for moderating. And thank you to all of our panelists here for joining us today and for lending us your time. Uh, Julie, feel free to take it away. Great, thanks, David. Thanks for that introduction. And um, thank you again to all our panelists for being here today. Um, so let me just start off by asking everyone to please briefly introduce yourself and provide a brief description of your work and your area of expertise. Um, so we can kind of go around the room, but let's start off with Andrew Jacobs. Afternoon, everybody. Uh, Andrew Jacobs. Uh, I'm the laboratory manager at the Wampanoag Environmental Lab with uh, Wampanoag Tribe of Gay Hidaquino. Um, the laboratory has been in operation for about 20 years now, uh, with a large focus on water quality, especially around the Minnesota Pond complex, Minnesota Pond and Squidnaki proper, and the Herring Creek that combines in between. Uh, it's only very recently that we've been getting involved with uh, monitoring of cyanobacteria and I'm pretty fascinating uh, what we found so far, and just working with the other island groups. Um, the interest that's uh, been generated behind it for public health and just environmental scientific study. Great, let's next go to Marcella. 
Hi, I'm Marcella Andrews. I am the laboratory analyst at the Wampanoag Environmental Lab. Um, and yeah, this year we added um, cyanobacteria monitoring to our surface water quality uh, monitoring program. So we were looking at um, the phycocyanin levels, uh, which is the pigment that cyanobacteria make, as well as um, identifying what species, if any, were present in the samples from Tupnokotani. Next, let's go to Emily Reddington. Hello, my name is Emily Reddington. I'm the executive director of Great Pond Foundation, and by training, I'm a biologist. Um, what we're interested in at the foundation is understanding the health of our local waters and sort of any aspect of their health from water chemistry um, to um, sort of biodiversity within them. And also looking now at cyanobacteria most recently with our colleagues around the island at the boards of health um, and trying to figure out um, how the different bits of the ecosystem interact and what their interaction is with the land and promoting health. So that's what we've been up to. Next, let's hear from Marina Lent. This is an experiment. Can you hear me? Yes. You can. Yeah. Okay, good. Because um, I'm working both on my computer and my cell phone with poor reception on cell. But um, I am working for the Chilmark Board of Health. And we have teamed up with the um, Great Pond Foundation because local boards of health in Massachusetts are charged with um, enforcing and you know, the, the, um, the regulations to protect public health. And the regulations that come down from the state are very baseline primitive, shall we say. They're sort of, if it's green, don't go in. And we were interested in really getting some more depth to this, um, to this issue and to the different things that people can do safely. At what levels can they do them safely? And so we are working on developing over, the, over time, developing something a little more uh, nuanced than watch out for green and, and stay out of the pond. Thank you, Marina. And uh, we've already introduced Dr. Gobler, but if you would like to um, add anything else, please do so. Oh, I think we're, we're good. You, you've heard from me for quite some time. So uh, yeah, have, let, let's hear from everybody else. Great, so then I will move on to the next question. And this is um, addressed to all of you. What harmful algal blooms are currently or potentially of greatest concern to the public here on Martha's Vineyard? Um, so um, Emily, how about we start with you? Thanks, Julie. I guess the what's on the top of my mind was cyanobacteria because that's one we've encountered regularly and one that we didn't have a monitoring system until uh, recently to deal with. So the folks um, at the Wampanoag Lab and from um, Great Pond Foundation and the Martha's Vineyard Commission all this year um, put their uh, sort of boots in the ground to try to get some information about what was happening in our ponds. And so that's the one we've been dealing with, but I'd say the greatest threat is the one we don't have a way of monitoring and we don't have any way of quantifying. Um, so Andrew and Marcella, would you like to add anything? Sure. Uh, some of the most significant issues, I guess, uh, largest concern is um, we've got ponds across the island that you're going to see blooms in, but not all of them necessarily have the degree of interaction with humans. It's that, that interaction that you're going to find illness and, and those uh, sort of problems that are associated with it. So your bathing beaches that, you know, fresh or, you know, the brackish systems, uh, public landings, I think those are going to be of the largest concerns because that is your direct point of contact. Um, almost as a secondary, something that really isn't as well studied is uh, the possibility of uh, the toxins becoming airborne. So certain areas, if those toxins become high enough and people are simply in proximity, I don't have that full information, but I would like to you know, see us investigate a little bit further to see if that could be a, a public health issue, that if you know, some of these areas are in a, you know, the state of a full harmful algal bloom, could that be uh, an airborne issue as well for people close by? Uh, yeah, like what Andrew said, whatever 
pond or beach or um, water body people visit and directly interact with, um, that's going to be the highest risk, potential risk. There is a, um, a bloom present. Um, and after that, the less interaction you have, the less potential risks. Um, and uh, further than that, we don't really know how, you know, if the toxins are present, how they're going to be moving throughout the system um, up through the food chain. So. That is definitely a big concern. Marina, do you have, um, what is your greatest concern from a public health perspective? Um, very, very much things that have already been mentioned. I do, again, we have to prioritize the places where people are going to be. Um, I understand ingest, direct ingestion is really the greatest health hazard. That means dogs and small children, the animals that don't have the discipline not to slurp in the water, but also we have to bear in mind, and I'm very interested in hearing whatever there is known about how it moves up the food chain, because we have much less visible, for example, are it, things like um, subsistence crabbing, or you know, people doing things in the waters that they've always done that are not big uh, tourist attractions, but are ongoing. And, and if they involve ingestion, um, I would really like to have better eyes on the issue. Um, then there's questions about, um, about wildlife. I mean, yeah, you don't, you don't hunt in the, in, the, in the summertime, but um, I really would like to know more about how it moves up the food chain or how it moves up the animal chain. Um, so yeah, dogs and children come first though. Um, yeah, next um, I'll ask the same question to you, Dr. Gobler. Um, you're not based on Martha's Vineyard obviously, but what harmful algal blooms are currently and potentially of greatest, greatest concern to you on Long Island? Yeah, I mean, I you know the ones I highlighted are 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 the are the big ones, and really, it's I would just say you know since obviously the the paramount concern is human health and then animal health, and so you know in freshwater the blooms all the freshwater blooms potentially can be producing toxins, um, and then in marine systems uh, you know we worry about Alexander getting into shellfish. Um, and, you know, and the other thing we always have to look at is the potential for uh, something unexpected happening. And I think about, for example, in 2015, I showed the, the, the turtles that had died. And so we had a, an event where there, we had uh, hundreds of diamondback cherubin turtles die off all at once. And uh, someone immediately suggested, oh, it might, maybe it's the red, the red tide that's going on there. And I dismissed it out of hand. I said, oh, these turtles are eating, probably eat seaweeds. And, um, but the more I learned, the more I realized it could be a possibility. And then we actually did a study and found, you know, we traced the DNA in the stomach contents of the turtles that had died to discover that they were actually eating rib, rib mussels and the rib mussels had, high, had a level of toxins that a, the turtle, a male turtle would only need to eat one mussel to receive a lethal dose, a female that's heavier, three mussels. So, uh, and that was, a, you know, an, an unexpected first time thing. So, uh, um, sometimes the things that you're not looking out for can be the most dangerous. Wow, that's so interesting. Um, and I'll just add that as someone who's out in the field a bunch, I get a lot of questions from people we encounter out on the ponds. And um, I'd say that the biggest question we receive is about cyanobacteria blooms. And that's definitely on a lot of people's minds. And a lot of people are very concerned about that. Um, so it's great that we have these folks here who are involved in monitoring programs. Um, and to all our audience members, the listeners, uh, I encourage you to write questions in the chat. Um, this is our forum and these panelists are here to answer your questions. So please chime in if you have any questions. Um, so our next question is, in the event of a harmful algal bloom threat, what role do the scientists and data collectors play and what is the role of public health officials? Um, so let's start with kind of the science-based panelists here. Um, Andrew, would you like to, to start? 
Sure. So I guess we can kind of break it down to, to three parts of you know, what some of our roles are, would be observation, confirmation, and dissemination. Uh, scientific community and the samplers were kind of the first line of defense right there uh, when it comes to some of these uh, algal events. The sampling teams are trained to recognize the occurrence of a bloom, uh, you know, report it back to you know, our internal communities. Uh, scientists are equipped to confirm the presence of cyanobacteria if it's in the water column or how it meets uh, you know, some of these standards. Uh, we can identify currents and potential risks within the water system and then take that, compile that, and then provide it to uh, different health officials or environmental groups who are associated in it. It would be for those groups to formally uh, introduce that information to the public and, and move forward with how they're going to uh, you know, act upon these ponds, whether it be a closure or just simply uh, up a warning tier. Great. Um, Mar Marcella, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I think the collectors at first, they're going to, you know, be seeing uh, the changes or uh, things that are appearing throughout the season. Um, so if they have great understanding of the area or what to look for, that's kind of the first step. Um, the scientists are going to confirm, we're going to uh, analyze the samples, look at them, and note where that falls within um, if, if it's set up with the, um, the standards for public health. And then the health agents can um, make, make a decision um, for the community based on that information um, and how to relay that information to the public in the best and uh, most concise way. Emily, would you like to answer the question? Sure. I think um, in the shoulder season, scientists can uh, work to figure out what's changed since the previous system, what's sort of new in the field, attend workshops, figure out um, if there are different regulations and work with public health to say, sort of put those uh, changes into context and uh, bring that information together. Because I think every year we've got the opportunity to make a better monitoring program. And I think during the season, it's helpful if um, quantitative data is reported regularly to the boards of health in a format where they can compare year over year or week over week how things change. And so um, being able to compare to um, measurable known standards and over time um, and making sure that gets updated on a regular basis. Uh, Dr. Gobler. Um. The question was, what role do scientists and data collectors play? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, the most important thing is is the data, right? I mean, and collecting long-term data time after time. Uh, on, say, in Suffolk County, there's actually a data set that dates to 1976, where some places have been re-monitored every single year. And so, you know, in the thick of it, sometimes monitoring can seem like, oh, well, you know, what are we really doing here? But uh, really, there's a lot of value in having long-term data sets to discern trends and changes with time. And, you know, picking out what are short-term blips versus uh, long-term trends. So I think that's, and, you know, I guess technically you might need a scientist to interpret all that as well. But, uh, you know, both are important. I apologize for the fire truck that just drove by. But um, we've heard from the scientists in the panel. Um, so now, Marina, in the event of a HAB threat, what role do public health officials play? Well, as I said, we are charged with, um, with implementation and, and policy making. And my, my response about scientists is, please answer all my questions. That's your role because I don't like to put forth policies that I don't understand and that I can't defend. Um, because I feel that, you know, living in a democracy, we kind of owe it to the public to have a good rationale for things that we ask them to do. So when I, you know, I need to understand, I know there is never a clear cutoff. Um, you know, a, a four-year-old on chemotherapy is a very different uh, risk level than a healthy 22-year-old um, splashing around in a certain pond. Um, so I need to be able to discuss all these things and we come to a sensible risk versus, 
you know, benefit conclusion that will prevent some 22 year olds from doing what they would love to do and would probably not be harmed by doing, but will also adequately protect um, people who need protection in a way that's, that's reasonable to society and then educate people about that and about their differential risk levels. And that's how I see us working together. Now, also public health is charged with um, managing and, and, and the requirements for septic systems. And I've seen some questions popping up in the chat here about to what extent can public health, you know, um, mandate better nitrogen reduction. And again, it is something that you don't easily lightly impose on people without understanding differential um, burden. Um, we could, you know, we could mandate all kinds of things and suddenly, um, you know, um, all of us who are not multi-billionaires would lose our home because we would no longer be able to meet those requirements. Um, so there's a, there's a balancing act between practical, feasible technology and cost. And, and where do we, how do we um, share the cost and share the risk among our community as a whole? Um, that's what makes my job interesting and, and challenging. But I think there is widespread support for um, better nitrogen reduction. And there is a range of willingness that different people have of both financially and um, in terms of what they, what they can do. I mean, I'm the kind of person who would put in a, a urine separating toilet and water my garden very happily um, and, and work a compost system um, very stringently, other people need to push the button and it goes away. Um, so that's a long and complicated answer <laughs> to a clear question. Great. So next we have an audience question from Steve Lewenberg. He says, this is certainly a problem here on the island and there is a critical need for action. Is there any low hanging fruit that we can start with right now? Um, and this is to everyone. So if anyone wants to answer, feel free. Um, we can start with Emily. Oh my, thanks, Julie. <laughs> um, so I think low hanging fruit, um, being aware of what you're putting onto your property, I think matters. So Dr. Goldberg pointed out that wastewater is one of the um, sort of greatest contributors, uh, but it's not always easy to pinpoint um, where it's having action. So you personally can change what phosphorus and nitrogen you're using on, on your lawn or on your body um, in your products. That's one thing you can do quickly, but also being aware um, of what's going on in your town. Um, uh, because we're facing two really critical issues. We're, we've, we don't have enough housing for our community and housing means nitrogen production. So where the housing's put on the land is gonna have differential impact. Um, but there's also, um, in addition to that, um, we have to think about how do we protect our ponds at the same time? So it's not low hanging fruit, but educating yourself is probably up there as one of the keys because it's going to take a community to solve these nitrogen and phosphorus problems um, but the community that's educated is going to be more effective um perhaps this is best um a question, a question best fitted for the the expert in the room dr gobler what do you think is the low-hanging fruit well you know i think that's a tough question. On the one hand, you could say, well, everybody should just fertilize less and that will be uh, that that will you know be a benefit. But in the end, if you find out that fertilizers, uh, household fertilizers is only five percent of the problem, and and we literally have found ecosystems like that on Eastern Long Island, you know, then you're, you're that, that effort will not really register per se. So 
you know, I think again, in the in the vein of having good science and good data, you really need to have those sorts of analyses. And but you know, if an area is unsewered, I just you know I can't imagine the scenario unless there's a there's active agriculture. Um, if an area is not sewered, it's likely the biggest source of nitrogen, even with big lawns, is likely to be uh, on-site systems. And so, um, uh, you know, that's that's something that I you know I think should be considered. Um, you know, Mariana's point is was is right on the money though. It's a big lift, um, and that's a big policy change. I'll say I will just emphasize though here in Suffolk County, the term I use is that this county has gone from worst to first, and that is the policies this county had just five or six years ago were, I think, the worst in the country, in that the wastewater was just being directly discharged right into the deep ground, which means the untreated wastewater was going into the, the aquifer, which we were drinking, uh, and then what we didn't drink percolated out into the surface waters. And uh, But now they have done a tremendous amount of work and have a very clearly science and database organized plan to get people um, to get people upgraded. They've prioritized exactly, you know, to the home level, which homes should be first to be upgraded and the funding's all there. So people can do this with almost no cost out of pocket. So um, anyway. I, can, can I ask a counter question? How do, do you know how the funding, how people came together to get that? I imagine there's a lot of different groups that had to make that happen. Do you know who got that started in New York? Yeah, well, I mean, it was sort of a coalition of uh, of different NGOs working, and I can call out uh, the Nature Conservancy, uh, and then other and non-national NGOs like a group called Citizens Campaign for the Environment. Um, and then using data uh, that that I had had, and then you know lobbying and speaking with uh, public officials, and um, you know, and frankly, here here's a here's a lesson to to that is very pertinent. Came there was also the funding opportunity. So Hurricane Sandy was a terrible event for New York, killed 100 people, but there was a 60 billion dollar funding package, um, the, San, the Sandy Recovery Act. And some some of that money was it was used to be able to improve the handling of wastewater because excessive nitrogen loading also degrades salt marshes and seagrass beds. Well, if you don't have your salt marshes and seagrass beds, your coastal communities are vulnerable to flooding. So there was a direct link made there. And I bring this out not to just wax poetically on history, but let me point out to you that the infrastructure bill that passed last month is $1.2 trillion. And I've read the bill, it's got a whole section on clean water. It's got 22 subsections within that section on clean water. They talk about wastewater. Um, you know, Sandy was a game changer for the, the Northeast region. It was $60 billion. This is 1.2 trillion. Now you've got everybody going after it, but this is an opportunity for places like Martha's Vineyard to, and Massachusetts in general, to I think step up, come up with a coordinated program, and get it paid for with these sorts of funds. But it, you know, it's going to take uh, rapid and organized action. There's a five-year window for that infrastructure spending plan, and um, you know, if you haven't done it, I recommend you look at that section on clean water because. Wastewater is, uh, it's, when they say clean water, it's really about wastewater. Okay, I'm going to jump in here because um, the, huh, we have, you know, on Martha's Vineyard, yes, we are the vast majority um, septic system, on site septic systems. Um, there is also a recognition that wastewater treatment creates a possibility of human density that the island, certainly up here, would not want to see. Um, and I can, I can address that point. Yeah. Um, and that there was the same philosophy that was taken here on. Long Island in that 
you know, New York City was built up in the 1700s, 1800s. And then at the dawn of uh, in the post-World War II, the first suburbia was, you know, mm -hmm. on Long Island and Nassau yeah. County turned into New York City. And then Suffolk County, was, you know, there was a first sewage treatment plant put in there and that was all built out. So there was the same concern. Um, and with that concern, we did the grand experiment of developing the rest of the island with no sewage treatment. And we've seen nitrogen levels go up by 200% in our groundwater yeah. during the last several decades. Yeah. And uh, I could show you the map, but you can, if I showed you the map and I said, draw me the line where the sewage uh, yeah. treatment plants end and where the on-site starts, you'd be able to do it because it's just very yeah. obvious. And, and, and so, but, and then the last thing I'd say in this front is that there's no reason that wastewater hand the handling of wastewater has to have anything to do with population density you know, handling wastewater is about protecting human health and protecting um, you know, the ecosystems and there can be regulations and population density that can be made that are completely independent of the handling of wastewater they don't you, need to be linked you'd think that was the case um Unfortunately, the powers given to public health are viewed by many as being more potent than the political ability to counteract the development pressures that come with opening up the option to have insane density. And that is, I'm, I really, you know, I do, I couldn't agree with you more. Nothing irritates me more than having to spend 80% of my time on something that was invented and did a beautiful job at preventing cholera, which is the on-site septic system. It's not untreated wastewater. It is beautifully treated as far as those very significant pathogens are concerned. Um, the nitrogen loading is a different story not to mention the household chemicals and the persistent household chemicals and the medications that we put through our system and put into the groundwater that way. Um, I wish people uh, that we had a political system that could be much more honest and courageous about making choices that do not necessarily lead to the greatest possible um, economic gain. Uh, for a community or for the individuals involved in it. Um, and that's where I see the real, uh, a, a real dilemma in what you're saying. And, and so developments in on-site systems that actually achieve the goal to me is like eating my cake and having it too. So that's, what I, that's why I mentioned urine separating toilets and composting and stuff because I want it, I want it all, you know? And I don't have a lot of faith in, um, the political system to make a strong and a decision that that does not prioritize economic gain. Well, it's certainly very encouraging to hear that potentially with um, this big um, infrastructure bill that was passed that we could maybe see some money go toward um, helping people get those nitrogen reducing septic systems because it's clear that that is a huge problem. Um, I have another audience question. Um, this one is from Megan. Besides upgrading septic systems, are there any short-term remedies like can flushing a pond flush out toxic algal blooms? Um, can, so, um, does anyone want to open that? Uh, does anyone want to answer that about opening ponds? I'm just saying we've there? actually done that on Long Island, Georgia Pond, and it works brilliantly. Um, you know, so long as you're, you're able to do it, we have restrictions due to piping plovers, but we've had many times Georgia Pond, the South Fork of Long Island, it's a temporarily open slash closed pond, and um, there's been at least three locations three occasions in the last six or seven years where there's been an intense cyanobacterial bloom, blue green algae bloom, and um, you know, I could show the data, but within days it just goes away. And it's a, 
it's both a dilution effect. You're diluting the, the blue green algae. You're diluting the nutrient source. Uh, you're flushing them out, and they, you know, they're freshwater organisms that can't really handle the um, the high salinity. It also, we see uh, on the island that uh, pond systems that have the larger flush rates have you know, less issues with water quality, uh, lower loads of nutrient, and like we aren't even seeing, uh, you know, these kind of algal blooms. So I'd have to assume with most of these other uh, ponds that are, are seeing issues that uh, flushing of these ponds would actually diminish the nutrient load and therefore probably flush out some of cyanobacteria as well. But for some of these areas that are, you know, highly uh, hit and heavily impacted, I think it'd be a great idea to put together some feasibility studies to see how this could work for our island. Emily, do you have anything to add? I was going to say, we, didn't, we weren't monitoring blooms this summer when cuts happened on the great ponds we were looking at, but we did see shifts in the phytoplankton community um, with the changing salinity. So when the ponds opened, you could see um, which species dominated. And I believe, did Tisbury Great Pond have some higher, they never had very high cyanobacteria concentrations, but I think um, once they started to go up a little, it was time for a pond opening and we saw those numbers come right back down. If, I'm, if I recall correctly, Julie or David, you might recall better. Remember the population shifting. Yeah, I, I haven't looked at those data in a while, but there definitely was a, a shift. Um, yeah, certainly opening a pond to the ocean causes a shift in a lot of things. Um, and it, I think can be a tool to help reduce these hab balloons. Um, Let's go back to our prepared questions. And this is a reminder to the audience that please continue to send in your questions. Um, Marina, let's ask you a question. What types of scientific data or monitoring information are the most helpful to make public policy decisions? Um, obviously the monitoring of the actual level of toxin and then Every bit as important, if not more so, is the understanding of the effect of those toxins on human and other organisms. Um, you know, we so I see us as we move forward, year for year, we will deepen our understanding. Um, we are monitoring many different places, and in some ways, we're monitoring some different um, parameters. And my hope is that the, that the picture that we will be able to put together after a few years will be far more powerful um, in terms of, of understanding the impacts. And I hope the solutions, although the solutions are, are, are already very, you know, are all very, very clear, but certainly the, the precautions that people have to take and and where to go with this. I, I get very upset when I don't have an answer, when a friend um, texts me and says, I want to go crabbing. Is it okay to eat the crabs? And, you know, first of all, if you have sores on your legs, don't go, we're having a bloom, blah, blah. But I need to know much more than that. And I need to know it with more security and better better understanding. Great. Um, does anyone on the panel want to follow up to that question? Um, yeah. I can move on to the next question. Um, this is also from Megan um, asking about phosphorus. So we've been talking a lot about nitrogen, but she's asking about excess phosphorus in brackish and freshwater ponds. Um, and she's asking, is this part of your monitoring programs and are there mitigation measures that you are aware of or would recommend besides upgrading systems, um, upgrading septic systems and limiting am animal waste and fertilizer? Um, Dr. Gobler, do you want to answer that? Well, phosphorus is definitely also important to know how important you kind of need to know precisely which system 
Um, it's going to differ per system and the type of organisms you find in that system. But in many, um, uh, in many, they, we've been harping on wastewater. The ironic thing is that the reason that wastewater is so important for nitrogen is that the night, when the, the ammonium from a wastewater tank is released, it's very quickly converted to nitrate and that just travels and is non-reactive through the aquifer. In contrast, phosphorus in a wastewater system uh, binds to sands. And so you actually get very little phosphorus coming into these systems from wastewater. Um, and in many of these systems, you know, the Martha's Vineyard, like Long Island, was formed during the last uh, glacial retreat. And so the way I like to explain it is that the ponds that are there now, in many cases, have been filling in with organic matter since that last glacial retreat, literally hundreds, thousands of years ago, not hundreds of thousands, thousands of years ago. And, the, and therefore, because they filled in with organic matter, it's those sediments that are often the strongest and biggest source of phosphorus um, to these systems. Um, the only exception might be if there was any direct wastewater discharge which, into a water body, which I doubt there is. Um, you know, surface runoff is also important, um, but it's for these reasons. I'm sure that phosphorus, I'm going to guess, is part of the monitoring programs, and it is good to know uh, the amount of total phosphorus in a system. It helps you uh, give guidance on the ones that are probably most vulnerable to uh, cyanobacterial harmful algal blooms. So any of the nutrient um, sort of sweeps that are done by the commission and the samples run at SMAST or by Great Pond Foundation, which are run at the MBL, they do have um, uh, phosphorus panels as well as nitrogen panels. Yeah, and Andrew and Marcella, you, you guys monitor phosphorus, correct, at your lab? Do that's part of our uh, our surface water quality program. We're, our levels, at least what we see around in uh, you know the surrounding area for Manipshin Squid Mountain Pond, uh, relatively normal. Um, we're not seeing uh, levels that are, are elevated uh, for cause for alarm, but this would just be within you know the dissolved community within the water column. You know, as uh, as Chris had mentioned, it seems that most of the phosphorus within the system would have been bound and probably locked into uh, sediment. So perhaps looking further into sediment content, maybe taking some cores and having them sent out might be a great way to get a better map of uh, these water communities. Okay, moving on. Um, so this question is directed to Dr. Gobler. With any emerging field of science, there are knowns and unknowns, universally agreed upon risks and things still being debated. Could you please clarify what we know and we don't know in the realm of cyanobacteria or any other HABs for which a public health response might be required? Yeah, well, that, that is a fully true statement. And, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the knowns and unknowns, as former uh, Secretary of Defense Donna Rumsfeld would talk about, there were the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. And, it, you know, as he described, it was the unknown unknowns that were the most dangerous. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, when it comes to cyanobacteria, to understanding the relative importance of, you know, the, what, what's going to be important, nitrogen, phosphorus, temperature. We talked about flushing. I think Andrew pointed that out, and that was very good good point that should be emphasized also. But the, the relative importance of those is gonna really be dependent on both each system and then the organisms present in each system. So I should, you know, just to, I said that a little bit in my last time, but let me just elaborate on that and saying that, you know, the reason that phosphorus ends up being something we do talk about in freshwater systems, because some of these blue-green algae cyanobacteria are what are known as diazotropes, which means they can actually make their own nitrogen out of nitrogen gas. So if you have a, a bloom that's fully dominated by them, well, then they, you know, they may be less reliant on the nitrogen. Um, although I will say even globally, there's been a shift in the, uh, how people interpret that because what, as it turns out, the, even the nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria, if you give them excessive nitrogen, they'll actually use that and grow even faster in fixing their own nitrogen. So it's, um, you know, but, Anyway, the uh, so some of the unknowns is is getting a handle for each individual system. You know what are the what are the sources of nitrogen, phosphorus. You know what's the temperature regime look like. What's the flushing look like. 
who are the cyanobacteria, um, and seasonally, how does the importance of those different environmental factors change uh, in affecting those systems? So, uh, you know, so there's a lot, you know, we, we know a lot, but there's a lot we don't know as well. Definitely. Would any of the other scientists like to follow up on the knowns and unknowns? Um, and if not, I will ask Marina if you would like to follow up. You've already touched on a little bit of what you wish you knew as a public health official, but is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, I would definitely like to see us, and this is so hard on the vineyard. Every, every year we say, you know, let's do all this what great stuff in the off season and, and, you know, prepare for next season. I think this is exactly part of the, the off season work that we were talking about. Um, and I want to not lose, not lose sight of it as we go get past the holidays and, you know, <laughs> only knows what COVID will bring us. And believe me, I've been nose to the grindstone with that. But I really like the more concerted focus that we're able to do by, by talking to each other in the off season and figuring out what we can do while we're all crazy busy in the summer with each other's information. And, and, you know, better um, public education, um, which is very hard when you don't have the bandwidth. I mean, I'm inspecting food establishments in the summer, hello. Um, but it's all about the effectiveness of public uh, health is all about public education. You know, I don't walk into somebody's kitchen and say, hey, put that chicken down and wash your hands and before you toss the salad. Um, it's all about public education and, and you know, let's, let's not lose this, this conversation and momentum and thinking about how to build on each successive season. Because I, I heard Dr. Gobler say about the value of long-term data and we are so excited and pleased with our, basically it's the first year almost of this level of, of observation and monitoring um let's continue to build it you know and and increase the quality definitely um we are approaching the end um and um we have time for one possibly two but most likely only one more question um so to all of you where do we have the capacity expertise and protocols in place to monitor and manage harmful algal blooms, and where do we have gaps? Um, Emily, would you like to answer that first? Sadly, I think we might have more gaps than we have um, monitoring regimes in place. I know, I think um, we have a lot of partners that we can work with. We're lucky to have um, Woods Hole right across the water, Dr. Goldler not that far away. Um, but sometimes the equipment and the expertise on island to recognize what different organisms are um, might be there, but it's hard to know who knows what, what equipment is where, and sort of, so an over, say we have one unknown um, bloom, knowing who to go to for first or what network could possibly understand it. I think we have some potential work to do to figure out um, what our resources are, what our capabilities are and kind of pull those and see how we would respond if there was a problem. Because like Marina said, in the summer, everyone's going every which way so busy. And so to have sort of that off season figuring out of if we have such and such a problem in salt water, who's the best to go to or marine, or in uh, brackish water or fresh water, because who can ultimately identify the organism often depends on where it's found, what the conditions are. Um, and so I think we have a lot of room to grow for capacity, but cyanobacteria we're really moving forward on. Yeah, Andrew and Marcella, would you like to add to that? If one area that we've been uh, fortunate to uh, somewhat excel in is uh, Marcella's become pretty great at uh, speciation of cyanobacteria, identifying uh, you know, what's within the water column. We've collected samples 
with some are being able to identify who the culprit of the blooms are. And it's, it, it's been quite fascinating. It, it's paid off, you know, significantly with the data that we're collecting internally. Um, when there was an initial bloom cited within uh, Chilmark Pond, uh, you know, everybody became aware of it, you know, did a great job informing, you know, the papers and, you know, the signage went up. But what we didn't realize, and if not for the continued testing, is that it was actually two separate blooms over a course of time, uh, completely done by two different species. Uh, found that the early uh, bloom was uh, Dilichiospermum, and then uh, the second one was Oscillataria. Either way, there was a bloom present, and you know, health officials uh, you know, took the proper course of action to you know, inform the public of, of the danger. But scientifically speaking, it, it was just fascinating that you know we were able to differentiate these. Something that we don't really understand very well, where some of the gaps are, is which uh, island pond systems or water systems are you know, affected by these blooms. We're not exactly mapped them out. There isn't long-term data. And what species are the culprits that are uh, causing these? Um, you know, most significant would be the, you know, the microcystins. And we have yet to see that within our pond systems. So are other people seeing you know, some of these larger, uh, uh, or more well-known um, culprits? And um, I guess beyond that, I think we'd also like to see um, any association of uh, toxicity within the waters during these blooms. You know, it just it's it's something so new, and I, I'm just very pleased that most of these groups are are so uh, invested and involved and want to continue this this research, and uh, us coming together and actually understanding you know how the island is is you know, functioning as it relates to uh, nutrient loading and how these blooms are you know, affecting the, these island communities. Um, it's something that we're going to need to map over time, but um, we've got some great people working on it. Andrew, you said two bl blooms or two different organisms in Chilmark Pond. Did you mean Chilmark Pond or did Sorry, you mean... Squid knock. Okay. Um, we're uh, wrapping up on time, but I'll give you, Dr. Gober, the last word for this question about capacity, expertise, and protocols for monitoring and management monitoring and managing tabs and about the gaps that maybe that you may be aware of. Yeah, well, I think this is related to my last question or the last question I answered. And that is, you know, I think you, for each individual system you're interested in, you just really need to have a good sense of, uh, you need to, it needs to be very well characterized. And that's both in the water and in the watershed. And, um, you know, you can't manage for what you can't measure uh, is a term that uh, I've used with some of my colleagues here. And um, so you need really good data uh, assessing watershed sources of nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, water body nutrient levels, temperature levels, water body flushing rates, and then what's actually in the water when it comes to those cyanobacteria uh, and other types of algae. Well, that's great. Thank you, everybody. We are actually, unfortunately, uh, just about out of time for this segment. Um, but I want to give an enormous thank you to our keynote speaker, Dr. Gobler, for joining us today. And I also want to give a, a massive thank you to all of our panelists uh, for joining us today as well. Um,